Uno Minoto. Remember, we always give people a chance to tune in. While we wait, I'm going to take my multis. <laughs> 15 seconds. We're going to be talking about sleep today. Sleepy sleep. <sighs> 30 seconds. Sleepy sleep. Hello, Joyce. Joyce, you look fantastic, by the way. Hello, Silas, my friend. I'll see you in a week. A little longer than that. Joyce, did I mention how great you look? Just letting you know you look great. That's all. Ten seconds. Five seconds. You guys ready? Are you ready? Okay. Talking about sleep. <clears throat> I actually have notes for this because I want to try and keep this video as short as possible. Sometimes I make videos a little bit longer than they need to be, but this one I'm going to try and make short. Okay, so we are going to talk about sleep, right? Um, sleep will literally make everything in your life easier, better, and you'll be more productive, okay? Um, all right, so let's hit some sleep stuff. Let's see here. Let me pull my notes up. So first of all, I'm going to throw a couple um, uh, statistics at you guys, a couple percentages. So <clears throat> let's see here. Um, sleep corresponds to a 50% higher risk, higher risk for obesity if you get less than five hours of sleep nightly. So let me say that again. There's a 50% higher risk for obesity if you get less than five hours of sleep nightly. Um, and that has to do with an increased levels of the hunger hormone ghrelin and decreased levers, levels of the appetite control hormone leptin. I'll get into that a little bit, um, a little bit later. <clears throat> you have a 36% increase in risk for colorectal cancer. Listen, cancer is some bad shit and you don't want to get it. So anything that can reduce the, um, the likelihood that you're going to get cancer is good. Um, you are nearly three times more likely to suffer from type 2 diabetes by getting less than six hours of sleep. Three times more likely to suffer from type 2 diabetes. That's pretty big. You are an increased risk of high blood pressure. You have a 33% increase in dementia risk, and that's pretty crazy. You are a greater risk for depression, irritability, anxiety, forgetfulness, and fuzzy thinking. Um, getting six hours or less of sleep on a regular basis can age your brain by three to five years. Pretty wild. 48% 40 uh, increase in developing heart disease, and you're three times more likely to catch a cold. That's some pretty crazy shit right there, right? So, all right, next thing I want to talk about. <clears throat> okay. So this is um, from a research study. This is a study called Short and Long-Term Health Consequences of Sleep Disruption. This was in the National um, Science of Sleep publication, 2017, um, published online, May 19, 2017. All right, let's see here. Here's what I want to read to you. Um, in otherwise healthy adults, short-term consequences of sleep disruption include increased stress responsivity. Basically, it just means that you're going to respond worse to stress. Somatic pain, right? You are going to have more pain that isn't really associated with anything. Reduced quality of life, emotional distress and mood disorders, and cognitive memory and performance deficits. For adolescents, psychosocial health, school performance, and risk-taking behaviors are all impacted by sleep disruption. Behavioral problems and cognitive functioning are associated with sleep disruption in children. Long-term consequences of sleep disruption in otherwise healthy individuals include hypertension, dyslipidemia, um, cardiovascular disease, weight-related issues, metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is basically a precursor to type 2 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and colorectal cancer. All-cause mortality is also increased in men with sleep disturbances. It's fair to assume that that would also um, hold true to uh, females. For those with underlying medical conditions, sleep disruption may diminish the health-related quality of life of children and adolescents may worsen the severity of common gastrointestinal disorders. You read that one again. 
may worsen the severity of common gastrointestinal disorders, right? Uh, how many of you have some kind of GI issue um, that might actually be able to be alleviated by just getting a little bit more sleep? Okay, think about that. All right, moving on. So basically, we're going to talk about kind of the, um, like, what is, um, what happens when you sleep, okay? There are two basic types of um, sleep. There's uh, REM sleep and there's non-REM sleep. And there's actually a lot more than that. But basically, think about it like this. When you go to sleep, your body goes through this, um, a series of uh, peaks and valleys. And so at the peak, um, you are more likely to wake up. That is when you are in the... Um, the um, shallowest part of sleep, okay? As you progress and you get deeper down into your sleep, that's when you're in the deeper part of, um, part of the sleep, okay? And then you come up out of that. So that peak to valley to peak, that is called a sleep cycle. Each sleep cycle will, wrap, will last roughly 90 to 120 minutes, and you will go through um, approximately three to five sleep cycles every night, three to six sleep cycles every night, okay? Okay, um, so let's see here. You have an internal clock that controls when you're awake and when your body is ready for sleep. This clock typically follows a 24-hour repeating rhythm um, that is also called your circadian rhythm. This circadian rhythm affects every single thing in your body. So you have this internal clock in your body that basically affects every cell, tissue, and organ in your body and how it works, right? Which is pretty crazy when you think about it. Um, if you aren't getting enough sleep or are sleeping at the wrong times or a poor sleep quality, you'll look more, you are more likely to feel very tired during the day, right? And that doesn't, not obviously, okay, that makes sense, okay? So what causes you to feel sleepy or what causes you to fall asleep? So, and this kind of goes to the 10 to 6, um, 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. So <clears throat> let's say it gets dark at um, uh, 6 o'clock at night, Okay. Normally what happens if we are hunter gatherers, what happens is as the sun goes down, um, we start to, um, our eyes pick that up, right? And so it was really bright out. Now it's not so bright out because the sun's going down. And so the body will start to secrete um, a uh, sleepy hormone called melatonin. Okay, melatonin is your sleepy hormone. That's a big reason why um, we used to have people supplement with melatonin um, because it does help uh, promote uh, falling asleep feeling sleepy so <clears throat> excuse me so around you know whatever sun goes down at six o'clock your body starts producing melatonin okay um you have to have that production of melatonin it has to be um, going on for a couple hours and then once it hits a sufficient uh sufficient level circulating in your bloodstream then you'll start to feel tired and then that'll be when your body signals you to go to sleep now what happens in the, the, and that would be when you are like, you are a hunter gatherer, you're living out in the woods, there's no artificial light around, okay? So what happens is um, in the time, in the day and age that we live in now, well, we have TVs, right? And we have iPhones and we have um, uh, light bulbs, okay? We have things that provide, provide artificial sources of light. Now light, there's different spectrums of light. And there is a particular spectrum of light called blue light. And what blue light does, blue light has been shown to disrupt melatonin production the most out of all the different spectrums of light. That's why for um, uh, iPhones and I think probably a lot of smart smartphones now, I have an iPhone so I can't talk about other smartphones. They actually have apps. That this is a self, this is how important, this is how um, legitimate blue light affects your sleep. They actually have things that are on your phone, right? So my iPhone will actually have something that comes stock it's not an app that you download. This is something that is um, already, um, it is part of the iOS operating system in my iPhone that I can set it to um, eliminate blue light on my phone. Um, and then basically the screen kind of changes some colors uh, when it um, basically gets dark outside, right? That's how, that's how legitimate blocking blue light is and how it affects your sleep. This is also why some people might wear blue light blockers, um, which are basically just sun, um, sunglasses that uh, block out that blue light spectrum, okay? So 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., right? Um, 10 p.m., if it gets dark around uh, 5 or 6 or 7, that's um, enough hours where melatonin builds up in your system and you feel sleepy, and then you sleep for that 10 to 6, okay? Um, that's my theory about why um, 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. tends to be the most... Um, 
recognize time of, that you need to be um, going to sleep, right? Um, all the studies that I've read on sleep really show that 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., that is the window that people get the best sleep, it's the most productive sleep, they get the deepest sleep, they get the most sleep cycles. And it basically just is, is that's the sleep pattern that you wanna follow, right? Has a lot to do with melatonin, but also has to do with some other things. Okay, so we covered that base. Next base to cover. This is gonna be a little bit, all right, so I'm basically gonna talk about the different um, things that happen when you have um, uh, insufficient levels of sleep. So obesity. Insufficient sleep has been linked to a high probability for weight gain. Um, several studies have linked insufficient sleep and weight gain. For example, studies have shown that people who habitually sleep less than six hours per night are much more likely to have a higher than average BMI, a body mass index, and that people who sleep eight hours have the lowest BMI. Sleep is, uh, is now being seen as a potential risk factor for diabetes, uh, excuse me, for obesity, along with the two most commonly identified risk factors, which is lack of movement and overeating, right? During sleep, our bodies secrete hormones that help to control appetite, energy metabolism, and glucose processing. Obtaining too little sleep upsets the balance of these and other hormones. I'm reading this to you guys because I'm, I want to make sure that I get all this information out to you, and I also want to make sure that I stay on track and it's not too long. So if it sounds a little boring, I'm sorry, but bear with me. For example, poor sleep leads to an increase in the production of cortisol, often referred to as a stress hormone. Um, a little bit of cortisol is good. High amounts of cortisol is bad. Poor sleep is also associated with an increase in the secretion of insulin following a meal, okay? Insulin is a hormone that regulates glucose processing and promotes fat storage. Higher levels of insulin are associated with weight gain, a risk factor for diabetes. Insufficient sleep is also associated with lower levels of leptin, a hormone that alerts the body that it has enough food, as well as higher levels of ghrelin, uh, a biochemical that stimulates appetite. Um, an easy way to think about this is ghrelin, um, stomach growl, growl, ghrelin, right? Um, ghrelin basically just lets your body know that, um, hey, it's time to eat. It stimulates your appetite, right? Leptin is your satiety hormone. Leptin essentially um, lets you know, let, it's a hormone that tells your body, hey, you know what? This person, you, you've eaten enough food, stop eating, you're not hungry anymore, right? And so when you have poor levels of sleep, those two hormones become disrupted. And that's a bad sign, or that's a bad thing, especially if you're trying to lose weight. Uh, as a result, poor sleep may result in food cravings even after we have eaten an adequate number of calories, right? So I want you to think about this a little bit. Um, how difficult is it to fall asleep in the middle of a meal, okay? Now, I understand if you're like a one-year-old or two-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old, like a very small child, it's not that difficult. But you know what? If you're watching this or if you're listening to this, chances are you're not a four-year-old, right? You're a grown-ass adult. And so one of the ways that we can trick our body into staying awake is by eating, okay? Because we're not hardwired to go to sleep when we eat. Uh, excuse me, we're not hardwired to sleep when we're eating, right? And so that's a, that's a really easy way to be able to identify um, if you are sleep deprived, is that if you're counting your calories or if you're on a specific meal plan and you've eaten all your calories and you're just like, you're just starving, you're ravishingly hungry, chances are you need to get some more sleep. All right, uh, let's see here. We may also be more likely to eat foods such as sweets that satisfy the craving for a quick energy boost. In addition, insufficient sleep may leave us too tired to burn off these extra calories with exercise. That's kind of self-explanatory, right? Like if you don't get a lot of sleep, uh, the likelihood that you're going to feel like getting your 10,000 steps in or the likelihood that you're going to feel like coming to the gym is pretty low. So let's talk about diabetes. Let's talk about sleep risk and diabetes. Researchers, researchers have found that insufficient sleep leads to type 2 diabetes by influencing the way the body processes in glucose, the high energy, blah, blah, blah. Uh, listen, um, basically anything that impacts your ability to process glucose, um, and if it impacts it in a negative way, that's bad. One short-term one short sleep restriction study found that a group of healthy subjects who had their sleep cut back from 8 to 4 hours per night process glucose more slowly than they did them when they permitted to sleep 12 hours, okay? Um, numerous epidemi epidemiological studies also have revealed that adults who usually sleep less than five hours per night have a greater increased risk of having or developing diabetes, type 2 diabetes specifically. Um, in addition, researchers have correlated obstructive sleep apnea 
a disorder in which breathing difficult, right? Most of you people know um, what ap uh, sleep apnea is. Um, there are two ways to, uh, this is actually an interesting thing. Um, a lot of people have sleep apnea because they're overweight, right? And if you think about it, like here I am, I'm laying down and I have um, excess fat on my face. I have excess fat around my neck. I have excess fat around my, um, around my chest and, and in my, um, all my uh, organ cavity, right? That's going to increase your um, likelihood of developing sleep apnea. So this is one of those things like, well, which came first, right? The chicken or the egg? Is it the fact that um, my, I have poor sleep? And that increases my potential to gain weight. And that in turn increases my potential to have sleep apnea. Or is it the fact that I developed sleep apnea first and that impacted my sleeping and that impacted um, um, my potential to, to gain weight? Not really sure about that one. However, they are linked. Heart disease and hypertension. Hypertension is um, high blood pressure. Um, even minor periods of inadequate sleep can cause an elevation in blood pressure. Studies have found that a single night of poor sleep and people who have existing hypertension um, can cause an increase um, um, blood pressure throughout the following day. This effect may begin to explain the correlation between poor sleep and cardiovascular disease and stroke. For example, one study found that sleeping too little, less than six hours or too much, interesting, more than nine hours increased the risk of coronary heart disease in women. I can't really talk too much on why there would be an increased risk of coronary heart disease in women, with um, more than nine hours of sleep, I don't really know about that, but um, the less than six hours of sleep makes sense. Um, uh, there's basically, there's, um, there is a, um, a growing evidence of a connection between obstructive sleep apnea and heart disease, right? And again, this makes sense. Sleep apnea basically means that you are not getting, um, you know, we go back to those sleep cycles and we talk about, you know, as you progress to the sleep cycle, right, you get your deep sleep, you get your REM sleep down in this area, and then as you come out of it, you're more likely to wake up. Um, this is also one of those things where if you wake up in the middle of a dream, generally speaking, you're going to have dreams in your REM sleep. And if you, make up in the, if you wake up in the middle of a dream, you kind of feel groggy, you feel a little bit confused, right? And that's because you just woke up in the middle of your deepest sleep cycle right? Um, in a perfect world, you would actually time it so that um, you wake up at either the beginning of a, um, of a sleep cycle, or you'd wake up at the end of the sleep cycle. And those are um, when you're going to feel the most rested. This is also why uh, the take a two-hour nap or take a two-hour siesta um, tends to uh, make you feel a lot better, is because it's basically giving your body enough of a chance to get through one sleep cycle. Um, so the sleep apnea thing and heart disease, again, this is a chicken or the egg thing, which came first, right? We know that sleep apnea affects sleep. You don't get deep sleep. If you don't get deep sleep, you have an increased risk of, of obesity. And if you have an increased risk of obesity, you have an increased risk for heart disease. People who have um, apnea typically experience multiple wakings each night to resolve the closing of their airway when they fall asleep. In addition, these, um, in addition to these sleep uh, disturbances, Apnea sufferers also experiences brief surges in blood pressure each time they wake up. Over time, this can lead to the chronic elevation of blood pressure known as hypertension. All right. Mood disorders. Okay. How many people know somebody who when they get low levels of sleep, they get pretty bitchy or they turn into an asshole sometimes. Okay. Given that a single sleepless night can cause people to be irritable and moody, it is conceivable that chronic insufficient sleep may lead to long-term mood disorders, right? Chronic sleep issues have been correlated with depression, anxiety, and mental distress. In one study, subjects who slept four and a half hours per night reported feeling more stressed, sad, angry, and mentally exhausted. In another study, subjects who slept four hours per night showed declining levels of optimism and sociability as a function of days of adequate sleep. All of these self-reported symptoms improve dramatically when subjects return to a normal sleep schedule. So I want you guys to be thinking about this. If you're taking a medication for depression, anxiety, um, or mental distress, okay, chances are that you can probably get off of that medication by getting your ass to bed earlier, 10 to 6. Get off your meds. Moving on. Immune function, function. it is natural for people to go to bed when they are sick. That makes sense. Hey, I'm tired. Um, I, um, I'm, I'm, excuse me, I'm sick. I'm tired. I want to sleep more, right? When I was going through chemotherapy, um, there would be times where I would sleep for 18 hours a day. 
Um, substances produced by the immune system to help fight infection also cause fatigue, right? Basically, the body's working harder, makes you more tired, okay? Um, okay, let's see here. Um, one theory proposes that the immune system evolved uh, sleepiness-inducing factors because inactivity and sleep provided an advantage. Those who slept more when faced with an infection were better able to fight that infection than those who slept less. So if you're going through an injury right now, chances are you probably need to be sleeping more. Okay. Um, in fact, research in animals suggests that those animals who obtain more sleep, uh, more deep sleep following experimental challenges by a microbial infection have a better chance of survival. So basically, they um, give a um, microbial infection to these animals, and the animals that can get better sleep end up having a better outcome in terms of survivability and um, beating that infection. Life expectancy. This is a big one for me. Um, I want to be able to live to be 100, right? And I want to be able to live to be 100, and I want to be able to do all the cool shit that I can do right now, plus a lot more cool shit. Considering the many potential adverse health effects of insufficient sleep, it is not surprising that poor sleep is associated with lower life expectancy. Data from three large cross-sectional epidemi epidemiological studies reveal that sleeping five hours or less per night increased mortality risk from all causes by roughly 15%. So that means that if you get less than five hours of sleep per night, you have a 15% um, increase of dying from everything, okay? That's all cause, that's all cause mortality, right? Um, okay, of course, just as sleep problems can affect disease risk, several diseases and disorders can also affect the amount of sleep we get, right? Um, now, that's something that I'm not really going to talk about because if you do have an issue, if you do have a disease um, that causes you to have some... Uh, uh, poor sleep patterns. That's something that you really need to go and talk to your doctor about. Um, all right. Let me just make sure I hit everything that I wanted to hit. Uh, let's see. Sleep hygiene. Okay. So we're going to hit sleep hygiene next. Um, okay. Sleep hygiene. Sleep hygiene is basically what you do before you go to bed. Okay. Um, so here's a couple big, uh, big rocks. Uh, you want to make your room like a cave. And what that means is that basically you want to have your room as dark as possible. You want to have a cool, generally speaking, you want your room to be um, around 63, 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, as dark as possible, um, even like a, a little um, a light from your alarm clock can cause you to have some disruption in sleep. Because when you close your eyes, you know, your eyelids are not, um, they're not like, a, they're, a, they're, light can get through, okay? So if you have a light, um, if your alarm clock is really bright, or a lot of times when Jamie and I go away um, and we're staying in a hotel, um, we will try and cover any, any even a little tiny light from a, like a, um, a fire extinguisher can sometimes cause you to um, have some, dis um, some sleep disruptions, all right? Um, so 63 to 65 degrees, make your room cold, as dark as possible. Um, background noise is really good, so we sleep with a fan. Um, so if you can, you know, get a fan going, that's big. Oh, my screen froze. Hopefully this is still going on. Um, so get a fan. Um, I'm a big fan of, um, uh, ha um, sleeping with a humidifier, especially during the colder months. Um, I noticed that when the room is over 40% humidity and ideally in that 50 to 60% humidity range, I sleep a lot better. Um, okay. So we got, um, dark room. Uh, cold, uh, humidity, um, uh, white noise or background noise. Those are things that you can do, you know, like that you'll be able to do right around your sleep. Um, no television in the bedroom. Okay. Things to do before you go to sleep. So uh, at least an hour before you go to sleep, try and stay off of all electronics. Um, I, if you can move that to two hours, that's even better. Now, that would include televisions. I understand that might be a little bit uh, difficult to do. However, like even if you put your phone down, um, that's great, right? There are two reasons for that. The first reason is that we want to make sure that we don't have exposure to blue light. Um, the second reason is that, uh, listen, if you watch like um, a suspenseful TV show or a suspenseful movie, um, right before you go to bed, well, your brain is still going to be going from that suspenseful um, TV show, right? And so you want to try and do things that encourage you to relax, okay? So that's the, um, that's the don't watch television or at least don't watch suspenseful things. Um, stay away from social media. That's a big one. Um, try to um, shut off all electronics an hour before you go to bed. Um, try and keep your house as dark as possible. 
Um, uh, one final thing is um, baths. If you can take an Epsom salt bath, or even just a hot bath or a hot shower before you go to bed, um, you will tend to uh, fall asleep uh, faster. Um, all right, so those are all the big ones. Let me make sure. Hey, Ben, thank you. I feel great. You should, Joyce. You look fantastic. Hello, Gina. Okay, no other questions. No other questions, blah, blah. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed it. Um, I'll be doing a video on um, uh, one of our sleep supplements, uh, Sleep Multiplier, and how it can improve your sleep and how it can get you better results. You guys are kicking ass. Remember, every day above ground is a good day.